All right, uh, then I'll, I'll get started. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the IBIS Amy seminar series. Today, we have Dr. Harimi Veraragavan uh, joining us from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing her today. Um, for usual, um, keep your questions uh, to the chat uh, throughout the presentation and uh, towards the end, um, I will open it for discussions. Um, so, uh, Dr. Harini, so I'll go ahead with the introduction. Dr. Harini Peraragavan has uh, received a Bachelor in Technology in Electrical Engineering from India. Uh, she, she received a Master and a PhD in Computer Science from University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Um, and she did a, a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon um, that was completed in 2008. Since uh, 2006, I mean, between 2006 and uh, currently, she has held different scientist positions, um, including some at General Electric um, Global Research, where I have not met Harini in person while she was working there. I think we kind of overlapped, or not overlapped, we actually, she moved on before um, I was uh, there. Um, since uh, 2012, um, Irene has been uh, attending a computer scientist at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. She had different positions, first assistant and now associate uh, since 2021. Um, in this position, she has a number of uh, awards, um, including many for deep learning and radiomic in either prostate or, or any cancer. I'm not going to go over those, all of them. Um, but more interesting from our perspective is that uh, she has been involved in developing clinical software that is based on AI, either AI-based AI auto-segmentation of organs, uh, head and neck, for uh, all focus on radiation therapy. Um, uh, Harini has more than 80 publications between journal papers and peer review, um, peer review conference paper, and it's uh, my greatest um, pleasure to see her present today her work on AI for longitudinal tumor response monitoring and image guided cancer treatments from the lab to the clinic. Harini, take it away. Oh, wow, that was a really nice introduction. Thank you so much, Mirabella. And I have to say you're one of the few people who can actually pronounce my name perfectly. <laughs> so, uh, so, so thank you so much. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, present to you some of the work that I have been doing since I've been at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, developing AI methods for uh, longitudinal tumor response monitoring and applied to image guided cancer treatments. Uh, if my clicker would work. Okay, so these are my disclosure. I just wanted to get uh, done with these. But none of the work uh, that I am going to present would have been possible without the collaboration um, that I enjoy with all the physicists uh, and the MDs that I work with at Sloan Kettering and uh, also all the postdocs that I have uh, been able to mentor through these years. So, um, I, I mean, it's like, uh, as you all know, the needs for AI in healthcare is really driven by the increase in the number of imaging that uh, the, the rapid increase in the number of imaging that are being done uh, for can managing cancer patients. It's like, and it's been really summed up very nicely in this paper by Hall Snee. It all where they, uh, one of the interesting things to me was where they said that the average radiologist basically has to interpret an image every three to four seconds. Uh, in an eight hour workday. That is actually a lot of workload. It's very, very intense. And uh, that really speaks volumes about why there is need for AI to help our radiologists do their jobs. Uh, so this is one of the works that I uh, did with uh, my collaborator, Eva, Eva Pekosta who's a radiologist, where we looked at uh, determining whether we can use machine learning techniques to uh, predict uh, or rather classify whether uh, from MRI after the patients were treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, if they were responding to the treatments. And one of the interesting things that we didn't expect to find here was that we found that the machine learning method actually outperformed uh, what the radiologists did, uh, even though radiologists combined T2 and DW imaging to do their uh, qualitative assessment. 
uh, we found that the radiomics analysis that was done purely using mm -hmm. TP weighted imaging actually did better than them, which was interesting to see. And since then, we have been working on also validating this on external data sets, and we have been finding interesting results. Also, um, as uh, all of you know, the standard way to measure response in the clinic is often using rhesus measures. And uh, these are uh, uh, more or less one dimensional. They really just focus on measuring the largest diameter of the lesion, which is longest diameter of the lesion, which is not necessarily the most accurate way to measure the patient's response during the treatment. And these are not volumetric, which makes it difficult to assess how well the patients are responding. And importantly, rhesus measures, measures are not routinely done unless the patient is on some sort of trial when they actually do these measurements. So this is a study that, this is a multi-institutional study that um, I did with uh, Rob Young, uh, shown here in the pictures. He's a, he's a neuroradiologist that I work with, where we used a a uh, machine learning algorithm to automatically segment the tumors over time. And we wanted to see whether if we quantify the tumor changes volumetrically, uh, how does that do uh, in terms of quantifying the response uh, in, these in this group of patients? These were all patients who had low-grade gliomas and they all had IDH mutation and they were treated with, uh, with a drug that was specific to the IDH mutation. And one of the things that we found was that measuring the volumetric responses show that there was a clear di di difference uh, in the growth rate from the pre-treatment to post-treatment. And uh, the change that we measured using the volumetric measurements was bigger than if you just used the Raynor measurements, which is a two-dimensional two uh, diameter that's often used uh, for uh, brain tumors. So as, as uh, all, most of you, all of you know, uh, I don't have to tell you, it's like radiotherapy planning requires volumetric segmentation. And this is a study that we published recently where we looked at uh, using an artificial uh, AI or deep learning method uh, for segmenting tumors. This is using an open source data set where five different radiation oncologists segmented the tumors. And you can see sort of the variability in their segmentation. But the deep learning method does uh, more or less consistent, uh, consistently compared to them. So which again uh, points to the fact that it's important uh, to get to use AI not just to aid in the clinicians, but all aid clinicians in their work, uh, but also could be helpful to improve the consistency of how we segment uh, the various structures. And why is segmentation uh, and reducing the variability is important is really shown in this work. So, uh, this was led by Maria Thor. She's one of my collaborators where she looked at using, comparing deep learning versus manual delineations that were done on the RTOG 0617 uh, trial data. And she found, one of the interesting things that she found was that the radiation doses that were planned using manual delineation uh, indicated that there was a significantly higher dose delivered to heart when they used manual delineation versus when they used deep learning. And this was actually quite interesting to see. This was a retrospective study. So we can't, so, so it's by no means uh, saying like this, this is conclusive, but it sort of indicates that the variability may have played a fact, uh, it may have played a role in uh, uh, in increasing the variability potentially. So here is a representative example of uh, tumors or heart rather segmented by a uh, deep learning algorithm and the same hearts that were segmented by a clinician. And you can see the amount of variability in how they were segmented. So there are, so if you wanna bring AI into routine clinical care, there are a number of challenges. So first, it's like if we want to focus on doing tumors, there is tumors have a lot of variability in their shape and the appearance. And uh, that makes it very difficult to segment all of these tumors. And also, if we want to translate them to new modalities, they're, they're, uh, first, it's difficult to get a large number of training sets in the first place and get them segmented. So training a deep learning algorithm becomes even more challenging when we want to use newer modalities. And finally, when we, we want to use them also for cone beam CTs, because patients uh, who undergo radiation therapy do routinely get cone beam CTs, and we want to be able to analyze them. Uh, but 
making inferences on a CompMC image, as you all know, is very, very difficult because they have very low soft tissue contrast and they have a lot of artifacts, which makes inference using deep learning very difficult. So these are some of the solutions that we have been developing in my lab. So we have been uh, developing new architectures because we want to be able to capture tumors and structures with a variety of sizes. Uh, and the technique that we have been developing in my lab is called cross-modality distillation learning, which tries to use information from other modalities, imaging modalities, to improve uh, the features that we extract from a modality like a CT or a comb beam CT so that we better differentiate the foreground from the background that we are segmenting. And then uh, to really track the longitudinal changes over time, we really want to be able to combine registration and segmentation because that allows us to really measure how things are changing over time rather than just using volume. So this was uh, the this is this is a network, a deep learning network called multiple resolution residual network that was developed by my postdoc then. He's a scientist now at MSK, Jue Jiang. And uh, he basically developed this network called multiple resolution residual network, which basically combines the advantages of using a dense and a residual network. The, the, the way that this method works is that it uses a number of these residual, so-called residual feature streams, which carry features that are modified at each one of these feature levels. And also it uses residual connections between the different feature layers. So in each layer, it's combining a number of different features extracted at different resolutions and from the previous layers, which allows it to, uh, to really get a larger number of features and combine in a highly nonlinear way. The advantage of using a res residual connection, as you may know, is that it improves the stability of the training because for a deeper network, you need these residual connections to back propagate the losses. And using this uh, uh, dense connection of features allows it to uh, really process a complex set of features. So because of this reason, uh, this network we did much better than a number of other networks. This is basically using analysis done at the time when we developed this uh, back in 20. 18, 19, I think. Uh, and it, it clearly shows that this method per performs better than these other methods. And importantly, it was able to segment tumors that were centrally located, which are one of the more challenging types of tumors that um, some of our clinicians really care about. They, they, yes, they also care about tumors that are located like nicely enclosed in the lung parenchyma, but they're somewhat easier to segment for these type of algorithms, but usually they struggle when they're located uh, more centrally. So, and, but this method seems to work fairly well. And we also use this to see if we could track a uh, response to immunotherapy in, uh, in a subset of patients who had long-term follow-up. And here are just two representative, representative examples that I'm showing where we were able to see that the algorithm quite well follows what a radiologist did. And there was no significant difference uh, between the radiologist and the algorithm. This, uh, this analysis is done using like 50 patients, I think. So then we, because we are able to do longitudinal segmentation, we then took the radiomics features that are calculated from these longitudinal segmentations. And we use these features using unsupervised clustering to see if we can uh, see any patterns in their survival. And this whole analysis is done in an unsupervised way. And we did see, interestingly, that there was a uh, clear pattern emerging that showed that there were low risk versus high risk patients based on these radiomics features. And most of the features that, were, that came out were the delta features, which basically indicates that the change in the features was indicative of how these patients were gonna um, uh, uh, how, what type of progression-free survival these patients were going to enjoy. This is the work that I've been doing with uh, Dr. Joe Deasy and Alan Tannenbaum. And um, 
a nice thing is it's like uh, this method that we that I that I showed is available in the open source search software. Aditya Apti is the person who uh, develops and maintains the search software. So if anybody is interested, please feel free to contact him. You can also email me, but very likely I will forward the email to to Aditya, who is really amazing in helping with uh, with anybody who's interested in using search software. So. Because this method seemed to work well for tumors, uh, one of my students, Hyman, uh, took the method and applied it to segment organs uh, in thoracic images because we wanted to see how it worked uh, to apply for uh, apply for radiation therapy treatment planning. She uh, evaluated it on the WPM Grand Challenge data set, and we found that the method actually performed as well or better than the uh, top three performing methods. Importantly, it seemed to perform quite well for esophagus, which is a structure that uh, that is generally difficult to segment. And our physicians spend a lot of time segmenting that, segmenting and correcting the segmentation that the commercial algorithms do. So because it seemed to work well, they were very happy to see that this um, did better than these other methods. And we have since implemented this method in the clinic. and uh, We have analyzed more than 600 cases uh, and so far, uh, it seems that it seems to work quite well. Somebody had a question? No, okay. Uh, moving on. So to, to improve this further, what we did is uh, we wanted to see if we could extract uh, information from images uh, to better represent uh, better represent the features for the individual anatomic structures. So the nice thing about medical images is that the anatomy is usually organized in a very nice way. There is a clear relationship between the anatomy. So uh, we use the idea, so self-attention is a way to extract information, uh, spatial dependencies of anatomy with respect to one another. But the problem with self-attention is that it's, a, it's essentially related to non-local means which means that it's computationally uh, and memory-wise very, very intensive. So we developed another technique which uh, uses, breaks down images into chunks called memory blocks, and we compute the, do the heavy uh, computation inside these memory blocks, and we pass information from one block to another. But because this is doing only in forward direction, we also add another one of these uh, attention layer, so now we have a bi-directional attention flow, and that allows us to do this uh, non-local computation in a very fast way. And we can implement it in a variety of different networks, no matter how deep the network architectures are. So we have implemented this technique for head and neck radiation treatment planning, and we have been using it uh, in our clinic since May of 2020. So here is a couple of examples that we see in our clinics. So obviously, uh, artifacts are a big problem uh, and the method seems to be fairly robust to artifacts. It also surprisingly is robust to uh, the cases when there are missing anatomies. Uh, we did not even anticipate this when we were training uh, because we didn't even know uh, this was the kind of thing that existed um, because we are computer scientists, of course. Uh, so, uh, but then we were surprised to see that it actually worked quite well, even in cases like that. So the, then we also wanted to see, we do random audits of the uh, algorithm to see how it's been performing. Uh, I did not have a chance to put the latest uh, uh, analysis, but this was the audit that was done back in May 2021 uh, by Sharif uh, El-Gindi, who is uh, one of the person who's driving the implementation of these techniques into the clinic. Uh, and uh, we found that the methods performed quite well. They did not really increase it. So added path length is measuring the amount of effort the user puts in editing the segmentations, right? So uh, yeah, there is, there is some effort put on oral cavities because they seem to be quite variable in how the users uh, like to segment them. But there wasn't a lot of uh, editing that was done for some of the structures like the parotid glands or submandibular glands and also the brainstem. And we also took this method and evaluated it on an open source data set that had like two different raters to see how it was doing with respect to the raters. 
And we found that the algorithm actually does better than the raters for the submandibular gland. In this case, it's a right submandibular gland. And it seems to be similar for the left submandibular gland. And Maria took the results. Uh, this basically, she, we wanted to see if, uh, if we can do well in segmentation, what does it really mean uh, in the clinic? What, what implication does it have for the patients? So Maria took these uh, uh, methods and she applied it on a set of patients to see what was the comparison between uh, the plants that were generated when we use the deep learning, which is shown, I believe, in blue. This is a DVH curse, and uh, versus the manual contour-based plants. And interestingly, we saw that there was a lot of dose variability when we used the, the manual delineations, whereas when we used the deep learning, there was a lot less. Which, which could be useful, right? When you want to implement um, some of these therapies. So, so this worked quite well for CT scans, uh, but we wanted to see how, but when we want to use it for cone beam CTs and for tumors from cone beam CTs, it's a little bit more challenging simply because there isn't much information in the image to begin with. So what do we do about that? So we came up with the different method to, um, to segment these scans and we called it cross-modality distillation. The idea of distillation comes from knowledge distillation, which is a way to basically take the information that is contained in a high capacity network. Typically it's a network that is big and it's trained with a lot of training data. And you use that to train a shallow network on a different task, right? Or, uh, or even the same task, but to do compression so that, that, that a small network can be used in a much faster way. So we used it in a different con in, a, in a completely different way. We are not using it for any knowledge compression. We use the idea that a different modality like an MRI contains more information about the uh, different tissues because it has better soft tissue contrast than say a cone beam CT. So we want to basically use the features that are extracted say by an MRI segmenter to regularize the features that are extracted by a cone beam CT segmenter in this case, so that the cone beam CT would learn to extract better features that differentiates between the different tissue types so that it can get a better segmentation. The, the trick here though, is if you wanna use MRI to help with the cone beam CT in the training, then uh, you would think that you would need the, the, the MRI coming from the same set of MRI and cone beam CTs coming from the same set of patients. That is a problem. <laughs> and we solved it by uh, using a, genera a generation adversarial network to call here a cross modality model to synthesize an MRI image. I'll explain a little bit more in a, in a few, in a, in a couple of slides. But why should cross modality distillation work in the first place? The key idea here is that the key to any computer vision problem is to learn to represent the image very well. Once you know how to represent the image, you have solved the problem of segmentation, right? So here, the, it's very difficult to differentiate between the tumor and its background, whereas it's much easier to do it than the tumor and its background. So all we need to do is extract features that will represent uh, the, the tumor in a way that it differentiates it from its background. So that's why we wanna use cross-modality distillation because we know that it can be done better with the MRI. So I spoke about this challenge. How do you do this learning when you don't have corresponding sets of images coming from CT and MR? And to do this, we first know that we can do, uh, we can train a model to do segmentation really well using MRI because it's, it should be an easier task to segment than if you wanna do it on CT. And we know that the problem really is that we have a domain B, uh, just a CT that is less informative. It has images and it has segmentations. And A and B, A happens to be MRI, are unpaired, meaning that they are from very different patients. And we want to come up with a model to uh, train the segmentation for domain B using information from domain A. How do we do that? 
They do that by using a gener training a generation adversarial network to produce or synthesize MR-like images, which if we can then use it on MRI segmentation model to produce segmentations, then we can use the features coming out of the MRI segmentation model to regularize the features computed by the CT model. The nice thing about it is that the features that you're regularizing then happens to be for the same tumor for the same patient. And they just happen to be uh, like, like different modalities. So you have multiple different uh, error signals that you can use to regularize the model, one obviously being the segmentations and the other, the features. So when we do this, uh, we applied it to segmenting comb beam CTs. We found that the model does, uh, this is the performance that you get with a standard unit. And this is the performance that you get when you use uh, this model, the cross-modality induced distillation. Uh, we see that there is a dramatic improvement in the performance, right? And we wanted to see why did that happen? And here are the feature activations that was produced by a unit that was processed, that was trained only with the Combium CTs. And here are the activations that are produced by a unit that was trained using the C-metal technique. And you can see the difference quite clearly that in the first case, the tumors, uh, the features are activating pretty much everywhere. There is no clear focused activation. Whereas in the second case, you see that the features that are extracted really should help in uh, getting a better segmentation of the tumor. We also looked at uh, if this was indeed the case. Uh, so we took the features from the last layer and uh, for, for a number of patients were in the testing set. And we looked uh, and we computed uh, unsupervised clustering using TISNI. And we see that there is a better separation of the features that are used for, for uh, arising from the tumor versus from the background when we use the C metal uh, approach versus when we use only the Combium CT unit. You still see that there is some mixing of the features from the tumor in the background tissue, but it's definitely better than in the case when you only use UNET. So because it works for cone B, we tested if it works also for CT and it does work quite well. And it seems to outperform one of the uh, current methods that, were, that used a somewhat similar approach called mutual distillation. And again, it's like the same, in the same way, we see that the separation of the tumor in the background is, uh, is done much better when we use C-metal versus when we use only a CT-based network. And the features again clearly indicate that there is a very good separation of these features. Then we wanted to see, because it works for CT and comb beam, we wanted to see does it work does it translate to MRIs? Because in MRIs, you get different types of contrasts. So could you use the contrast from one, one type of contrast to help uh, segmentation on a different type of contrast? And it turns out it we didn't think that it would help, but it turns out that it does help a little bit. It does improve a little bit. This is for segmenting organs, uh, abdominal organs. And in both cases, when we use only T1 versus the C-metal approach, or T2 versus C metal approach, you can see that there is an improvement in accuracy. Although it's like it's not as remarkable as you would get when you use like a so when you do the segmentation on CT or Compium CT. So I'm gonna switch gears and talk about a slightly different problem. So the, so now that we we know that we can use this type of distillation learning to segment on uh, scans that have low soft tissue contrast. There's another problem um, with, uh, with advances in MR-guided radiation therapy. We do get a lot of uh, MRI images, but uh, there are needs for segmenting on the MRIs that we cannot meet because we do not have a lot of labeled images. And sometimes there are just, uh, there are not even that many, that many scans that are available because this is just uh, still a new technique. So a problem that we tried to solve here was, can we then use, repurpose the methods we have been developing to do unsupervised learning when we have only limited data set? So the problem is slightly different in the sense that 
we again have two domains, A and B, which are unpaired, which means that they come from different sets of patients. But then in this case, again, it's only this, uh, say in this case, CT domain is the only one that's labeled. The other one, MRI, which is our target domain, has only images, but no labels. Right, so again, we can use a similar approach where we can take the CT, generate MR-like images and train a model with that, and then use that model to help segment on the real MRIs. But it's not so simple, as most of you who have used generation adversarial networks would know, that uh, there is this case of uh, disappearing tumors. Uh, the problem being that standard techniques, standard GAN techniques, when you directly apply to transform CT into a MR, because the soft tissue, I mean, the density looks similar to the uh, background, it tends to remove the tumor. So here is a cycle scan and here is what is called a unit scan and they both sort of remove the, the tumor and they make it look like the rest of the uh, tissue. So we had to come up with a different approach that, uh, reg that uses the geometry information that there is a tumor that exists and that needs to be preserved and uh, from, the, from the CT to the MRI and, we and use that as a constraint to uh, keep, these, uh, keep these tumors, right? So we improved that a little bit more by using uh, uh, in the adversarial training by using what is called a joint distribution constraint. The idea is that you, if your goal is to do segmentation and you're segmenting using images, you want to, the discriminator to make use of both the images and the segmentation maps that you use. So uh, once we did this, it's uh, quite easy to implement. You use it, the discriminator uses a joint distribution as opposed to only the images and that allows it to better preserve the, um, the various structures that it's trying to synthesize. Just to visualize how these constraints work. So here is a real MR image. This is a segmentation map that was produced from this image. And when we use the a standard GAN type of loss, these are the feature activations that are produced. Whereas these are the feature activations that are produced from a, sorry, this, this is the feature activation produced from a synthesized image. These are the feature activations that are produced when we use the geometry constraints. You can see that it's like, like forcing the geometry, the rough geometry of the structures that are being segmented to be preserved better. Whereas this is uh, what we get when we use the joint distribution constraints. You can see the internal structures, uh, the textural char texture like characteristics of the structures inside are also emphasized. So, which allows us to get a much better synthesis. And, when, and because of that reason, and this is important when we are doing unsupervised learning because we are training a network to uh, segment with the synthesized images and we are applying it on real images. So we wanna make sure that the synthesized uh, images, the characteristics of the synthesized images are good. And we see that because of that reason, we are able to get a much better segmentation using this method versus the other methods. And uh, we can also use this to track how tumors are changing over time. These are patients uh, with lung tumors who are treated uh, with radiothe radiotherapy, but got weekly MRI scans. And we are able to see how these tumors change volumetrically and they follow what a radiation oncologist would draw. Although it seems like in this particular case, the, the algorithm segmentation seems to uh, over over segment a little bit, but it still seems to match the trend of what the radiation oncologist was seeing. So all of this work that I talked about, I only talked about tracking volumes, just about how the volumes are changing, but there is more than volumes to tumors and tissues. So if you want to track uh, additional things, like say, for example, in radiation therapy, we want to track the dose over time, or we want to really track how the physiologically the tissues are changing over time, we need a little bit more. We also need registration. So this is a new technique that we developed recently, which combines registration and segmentation as a single network. And it uses a recurrent network formulation because the problem is when we are tracking 
anatomies that are changing during the course of treatment, it's, it's difficult to do that using standard registrations, standard deep learning registrations. So we uh, used a recurrent uh, formulation uh, using convolutional long short term memory networks. And the nice thing about this is that we are able to model large changes in the tumor sizes. What you see here is the deformation vector field. And this is basically showing the steps, basically generation, generating, I'm showing only like the step two, four, and six that are eight steps that it uses to go from this image, the planning CT image to, I believe this is a week three or week four comb beam CT. Uh, it produces uh, successive deformations of the tumor until it gets to uh, something that matches what is seen on the comb beam CT. These are the feature activations. As you can see, the feature, feature activations also change uh, with each uh, progressive uh, step, uh, emphasizing different parts of the image so that the uh, places that were not aligned before are aligned better. So using this approach, we can track the changes of the tumor and also in this case, the esophagus over, I'm showing actually two tumors here. Also, there's also esophagus over time. And interestingly, we were able to use that to see uh, how the esophagus expands as a result of radiation treatment. And, and uh, usually uh, it was observed in one of the earlier studies led by Maria Thor that esophageal expansion was related to acute esophagitis. So we wanted to see whether we could see that using the deep learning based registration. And we, uh, this is an early, these are some early results where we found that this is all done. There is no, there is no um, model fitting or anything here. So it's basically using the results of the registration to get the expansion measures using the Jacobian determinant. And we see that as early as in two weeks, we can see a difference in patients who had acute esophagitis versus no acute esophagitis. So we are actively translating a lot of the methods we have been developing into the clinic and uh, Eve, uh, Aditya and uh, Sharif are the three people who uh, are extremely, have been extremely helpful in uh, moving the methods that we've been building in, our, in my lab into the clinic. And we do work with uh, a very multi multidisciplinary team of uh, radiation oncologists, medical physicists, anatomists, computer scientists. We all meet regularly and we have to go through a lot of uh, iterations of improving these methods, which has been extremely rewarding. And I have to say that uh, it's, a, it's a lot more fun than just doing research. And uh, we have been implementing a number of methods uh, over these years, and these are all some of the methods that we are uh, testing clinically, and these are other methods that we will be implementing hopefully soon. And uh, looking ahead, I have also been working with surgeons to analyze uh, endoscopy images longitudinally. The idea is that can we use deep learning to uh, early detect when the patients who are treated with new adjuvant chemotherapy are going to recur because surgeons then want to intervene to operate on them. So these are the patients who were kept on watch and wait, means they, uh, and they, uh, because a lot of patients who get colorectal cancers are very young, so they want to preserve their organs. And, uh, but, but they want to observe how they are progressing. And often when the surgeon keeps, um, uh, looking at the endoscopy scans, apparently there is a lot of variability. And also they wanna see if we can find uh, um, the development of recurrence earlier than a surgeon can do so that they can intervene uh, earlier on these patients. Also, uh, we are working to see uh, if we can uh, predict functional characteristics of tumors and how they're changing over time. The, this, uh, this study is really like led, um, I'm working with uh, Joe Deasy and uh, Dr. Nancy Lee and John Hum. Uh, the goal really for Nancy Lee is really just to see if we can predict hypoxia characteristics from uh, uh, longitudinally so that she can de-escalate. Uh, and uh, we also want to see if we can uh, predict the model how the tumors are going to respond.
So in summary, so we have been uh, developing longitudinal analysis techniques and we see that we can extract more useful information than what is uh, possible only through manual interpretation. Um, the, the, the biggest advantage I've had like by having a translation focus of the research that I do in my lab is that it, it, it requires me to develop very rigorously tested methodologies and it requires very close collaboration with a number of different, uh, uh, with a very multidisciplinary team, which is, uh, it's sometimes is frustrating because you have to go back to the drawing board, but it's also very, very rewarding. Uh, and uh, we are looking at also doing early detection of treatment toxicities and seeing how better we can manage patient care. Um, so that's all I have. I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, Harini, thank you so much for this fascinating presentation. I'm sure um, a lot of folks have questions. Uh, so the presentation is open for questions right now. Raise your hand if you wanna ask a question or post it in chat. While that is um, happening, I'm going to wait for a second, see if anybody's asking a question. I can start maybe with one question. Um, I love the amount of uh, work you have done in, in um, looking at cross modality, which is one of the focus that we uh, or I have in my lab as well. Um, but your perspective is very different than ours, and I love seeing your research um, on that aspect. I did have a question about registration uh, specifically. Um, you are showing how the registration method is actually essentially aligning the tumor um, in between those two scans. But isn't that something, uh, information that you don't want to register, as in you want to see the change that happened between, let's say, my, week two and week four, and you want to preserve, you don't want to align it because you are kind of washing off that uh, that information? If I'm, am I misunderstanding how this works oh, and why oh, is that okay. useful? Okay. Let me explain that a little bit more. So the reason for that is uh, also driven by the fact that we wanted to do dose accumulation. So when you want to do dose accumulation, you do want to bring them into good alignment so that you know how you, uh, how you transfer the dose. Uh, but, but, it, it, but it is, uh, uh, but you do really want to also, you want to track how the tumor has been shrinking over time, right? So if you want to track how the tumor is shrinking over time, you do want to warp it to what is changing over time. But the problem you're talking about is a little bit different. And it's also very interesting. It's a new work that uh, we have been looking at, but in the context of um, aligning different patients where you want to keep the tumor as it is when you want to align a patient uh, moving scan to a target scan, uh, and in that case, you have to use different types of constraints to basically force that the tumor does not change. But, that, that, but in this case, we do want it to change because we do want to see how it is uh, reducing in volume over time. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Lei, do you have a question? Yeah, can I ask you, uh, yeah, you know, a lot of work, so... Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I just want to ask you, uh, you know, I actually ex somewhat surprised that uh, you didn't train your model with, you know, with the image, with the artifact, and then that ending up, uh, you get a good segmentation. So maybe you can elaborate on that. Uh, oh, no, no, sorry, if that wasn't clear. So we do have to train. So you oh, mean okay. like for the Combium CT, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. We oh, do so have to, to, we have to, so in this case, sorry, I have a CT image here, but we do, we do train two models. One is using the CT, I mean, comb beam CT. There is a model that's training with the comb beam CT images, okay. but it's also, there is also a simultaneously trained model that is using a synthesized MRI. So no, you do have to train this. If you don't train it, it won't, it won't work. Okay. So, you know, back to CT MRI. So as a feature, what exactly, you know, if you really look at the feature, are they, what, what do they share? I mean, if you, so you just really just get the MRI feature and then concatenate the MRI mm -hmm. feature with a CT feature and then form a big vector. It, how, how do you do it exactly? It, or you just use the 
you know, they said, uh, can. No, that's, that's also an excellent question. So no, we do not. So, so we do not concatenate the features. When we say feature distillation, what we're trying to do is we're trying to force this network to produce some of the features like the MRI model. And we do not want it to produce every feature like that. So it's like, for example, we do not, we know that the low level features extracted by the, in, in the encoder layer should not resemble these two networks, right? Okay. Because the features of the CT or a combined CT are inherently different from an MRI. So we really force only the high level features and to force the features to be similar, we use a distance metric uh, the, the features that are produced in the, say like the, so the closest to the uh, output layer would uh, match uh, with the features that are extracted by a CT or a cold beam CT uh, at closest to the highest level. Uh, so, using, oh. using, using an, you can use the Fabrenius norm, you can use the Washerstein distance, you can use any type of distance metric, but you just force it to, the, just a distance, calculation that the features are matching. Okay, it's so, so that, uh, that distance here is in the image space or in the in the uh, feature space? Uh, it's in the in features, the it's in the feature space. space. Yeah, Okay. but right. close to the output, because that's one thing that we also, we also experimented with it, because it's like, if you, if you do this uh, close to the input, uh, those does, that doesn't work very well because it sure. really has to, the, the features are inherently mm. different and they have to be different, right? Yeah, you have to let them settle a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions from the folks attending? May I ask a question? Please. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. I very much enjoy your talk. I was hoping you can um, expand a little bit more on the work done in endoscopy. Um, what are some similarities and challenges associated with uh, analyzing uh, endoscopic images, which is in contrast to CTMRI, not standardized with respect to image acquisition, standardization, et cetera. So can you speak to that a little bit and what kind of data set you use and what did you use as your um, sort of a standard um, in that regard? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this this is uh, this is more of a preliminary work. This work was uh, uh, so here we were just looking at the feasibility of whether or not it is even possible to do this. And you and you really brought the uh, I mean the the question that you asked is is the key is a key issue here, right? Because uh, there are a there were a lot of challenges when we started looking at these images and the and. The, the illumination, slight change in illumination was causing issues. There were issues, for example, when um, uh, there was, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's like whatever, like it's like, like blurring because of liquid or uh, 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 like you can see like these type of things. Uh, so all of these things were an issue here. But the thing is that these are all RGB images. So we did do some pre-processing to, uh, to convert them into like the LAB color space to do the analysis. And then uh, because this was one of the first studies that we did, um, like Hannah Thompson is the one who led this. She's a, she's a surgeon, surgical resident. She went through and she only selected cases that seemed more or less similar in terms of quality because there are some cases where the quality is really, really, bad and um uh in terms of the network that we trained we basically this was done using uh fine tuning a resnet essentially to see if it was even possible to classify with these type of images but uh but it, but these images are interesting and there is a lot of work to do and uh and uh, there there are issues with harmonizing these images just like we have with MRI and perhaps in some cases even more challenging because the kind of artifacts and differences that we see in these images are, are very, very interesting. Thanks, yeah, we're working with um, cystoscopy images. So, mm -hmm. you know, within the urinary tract, um, mm -hmm. I'm a urologist, so we're facing some of the similar challenges. So I was curious to see how you guys try to overcome it, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can we can chat more later. It's like I can, I'm happy to talk. Terrific.
Any other questions from the room? Maybe, well, folks are still thinking about their questions. I can ask a more high level question. So you have implemented some of your methods in the clinic. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about your experience in using this in the clinic? Kind of how you go from that paper that, you know, presents the method to that method that actually gets used in patients? That's a, that's a very, <laughs> that's an excellent question. So first, um, Rightfully so, radiation oncologists are always suspicious uh, when, we, when we bring a method to them and say this will work. Uh, they really want us to test them uh, quite rigorously. So we, so we actually have a group that meets bi-weekly. And uh, anytime we develop any type of algorithm, it goes, so we first have to, we test it on all the external whatever data sets that we do. Then uh, we uh, get a bunch of random, uh, randomly selected internal images and we have an anatomist uh, who works under supervision of one of the radiation oncologists for that specific disease site. So we will segment these cases using these methods. It goes to her. She will look at it with, uh, with the radiation oncologist and we get like a no go, no go kind of thing. And if it's a no-go, we go back to the drawing board, try to understand where it is that it didn't work. They do explain to us where they didn't like it and where it was not acceptable. And we work on improving it often. I mean, we, we may have to add new training data. We have to, and one of the most important, one of the main reasons where we have found that we have issues is because uh, we, when we train our methods, say on open source, the public grand challenge data sets, right? Uh, a radiation oncologist would say, no, this is not how I would, I would segment it. I don't want it like this. I want it in a different way because they have their own way of doing it. Uh, and MSK has their, their way of uh, defining contours and whatever. So they want it that way. And so we often have to go back to retraining the networks. We go back and we do it in a cyclical way. And uh, it usually gets uh, rolled out in like a testing fashion. So they would, uh, they would have it side by side what they're using. They will analyze it. They will check it if they like it. And if they like it and they seem to be okay with it, then it, will get, then it gets rolled out. So it goes through a process. Um, <clears throat> that, that's certainly very, very good. And all these are retrospective studies or are you uh, at any moment doing any prospective studies as well? Well, the, the, the methods that are used in the clinic are all prospectively right. evaluated, right? So, uh, so my group's focus really is on developing techniques. And um, in some cases, if the, there are cases where we would do prospective studies. So in this particular case, with the endoscopy projects, and now that we've seen that it is feasible, we do want to look, uh, we want to improve this method a little bit more, and then we do want to use it prospectively on patients who are going to be selected for watching weight uh, with Dr. Julio Garcia Aguilar. And also the, the one that I mentioned is this work that I'm doing with uh, Nancy Lee and uh, Joe Deasy. Uh, this is another work that we are planning on uh, evaluating uh, on prospective data sets. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Any mm -hmm. any questions from any more questions from the folks on the call? Okay, so Daniel Kapp has a question about validating this with the uh, I assume RCT, so uh, randomized controlled uh, clinical trials. Uh, right. Great question. Daniel. Great, great question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. So, uh, so we do want to do uh, so the methods that we've been de we developed for comb beams. Uh, that is something that um, that the radiation oncologists do like, but they want to see whether they can use that to um, to adapt the treatment plans for the patients, and they do want, and we do want. We've been talking about doing a randomized uh, clinical trial for 
uh, patients uh, with lung cancer who they may want to do adaptive treatments just to like spare the esophagus or like spare um, heart for uh, reducing cardiac toxicities. So that's where we are thinking. That's, that's the one that is closest to where I know that we are thinking of doing randomized control trials. Thank you. Hmm? I mean, that's the touchstone, that's the gold standard. And so few of the AI studies that are brilliant in their conception and development are ever tested in a randomized control manner. So the clinician is left without the gold standard that we learn to appreciate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but we do need, uh, so to do these studies that we need a, a clinician who would champion it. And it's like, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's nice to have someone who would uh, take on the role of leading that trial because we can't, we can't, I mean, I can't do that. I'm a computer scientist. Thank you, Danielle. Any, mm -hmm. any other questions? I think we have time for one or two more. Late? No. Uh, well, just a quick technical question. Uh, so your clinical implementation is on the platform that the MIMP, I see your slide here. Yeah, uh, so it uses a, so let me see if I can go back to that. Um, so you write a script, uh, that's how you do it? So yeah, it's a, so it's a lot of stuff is done, managed by Sir. Okay. That Joe Dizzy's uh, lab has uh, developed, uh, but uh, Sir, Sir sort of sits in the center of it all. Although I've sort of like shown it like at the at the corner, uh, but uh, we have this uh, thing uh, program that we had developed called uh, Ensemble of Voxel Vice or Attributes, which uses Sir and uh, and MIM provides a number of scripts that we can. Um, we can access the APIs. We can get the data, actually a different slide. The one before describes it a little bit better. So, so we have like implement the EVA pipeline has the DICOM listeners and file watchers, which would extract as soon as the images become available available and using, and by reading the DICOM uh, structure, they would know what disease site they need to be routed into. And then Sir manages that to uh, pass it to the high performance computing and it calls a specific segmentation container. Then it puts it back together as RT structures and sends it back into okay. the MIM. The only reason to use the MIM is because that's the one that is used clinically by the radiation oncologist and they need uh, it in a software that where they can see the segmentations and edit it. So that's the reason. Uh, yeah, it, it looks like you don't, you don't need an API for mean, right? You just, it looks like you have a third mm -hmm. engine, just do all the job and then just import, export mm -hmm. from to the MIM. Uh, yeah, exactly. So we could we could easily replace MIM with any other software, as long as we are a, we have the capability to extract the images from it in an automatic way. It's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, Join me in thanking Dr. Verara Gavan uh, for the very interesting presentation. And uh, thank you for joining us, Harini. And uh, this was very, very good and fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. I will follow up with, with an email, Harini, um, so we can connect and maybe uh, start some collaborations. Absolutely. Would love to. Okay. I, I, so. wish, I, could have, I wish I could have been there and met you all in person. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we wish the same next, next, next time. Yep. Bye. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Bye, everybody.